Welcome to the Southern Report. Thank you for giving me the privilege of your time. I'm sitting down again with my friend John Haller. John is thousands of miles away on the West Coast. I am here in the UK and there was an event that just happened in the last few hours that is rather rather big. You may know about it and we're going to discuss it and come up with or just find out what the immediate reaction is and the implications of it. John, thank you so much for joining me on a the other side of an event. So let's just say it. we've just had the presidential election and uh, it was won by Donald J. Trump. And according to something I have seen, he has just he has also won Arizona. It looks like he's won all the the uh, swing states and he could end up having the Electoral College vote of 316. Of course, he needs 270 once the first person's made that, then they're president. John, you and I had a conversation a few uh, a few days ago before you flew out to California. Yes. What happened? Well, What's your feelings? What's your feelings? Well, I. Um... So this is interesting, Mark. I mean, so, of course, we Americans are sort of constitutionally incapable of celebrating a victory. So there's a much, much division within parts of the Christian community about this, because there is a view that, uh, like with every president that we've had in my lifetime, that the American president is the Antichrist. And so you should never uh, support the president. You should never do anything. So we, we just can't celebrate a victory. It was a tremendous victory for the right-wing conservative part of the political spectrum in America. Uh, Trump won. And look, when we talked, you know, we were doing running scenarios about what happens if Kamala Harris wins, what happens if the Democrats get the House, the Democrats get the Senate, but Donald Trump wins. You know, we're, we're sort of uh, gaming all of those mm -hmm. different scenarios. Right now, uh, the Republicans, of course, Donald Trump won big. Uh, he'll take office on January 20th, we think. There's there's still one big glitch that I think we need to talk about, the New York felony conviction case that's Absolutely. still ongoing. And a lot of it's sort of gone down the memory hole for almost everybody. Uh, he's scheduled to be sentenced on November 25th or 26th on that. Uh, and the judge is, you know, the judge is just incredibly anti-Republican, anti-conservative, anti-Trump. The prosecutor, of course, is. That case is on appeal. I had hoped that the uh, the Pell Court hearing was several weeks ago. I had hoped that the court appeals uh, in New York might have expedited the decision on that appeal. I don't see how the case stands. But it could, you know, the the judge, Judge Merchan, whose daughter is a major Democratic Party fundraiser, a clear conflict of interest that would require him to recuse himself. He won't recuse himself. He allowed all kinds of things into the case, some of which were improper under the Supreme Court's ruling on the presidential immunity certain conversations and things that shouldn't have been allowed to be put into evidence or put into evidence. So there, there's that problem. But then when the Court of Appeals heard the case, you can find the uh, you can find it online. It was it was pretty interesting. They they the the prosecutors defended their case and then the judges started pushing back. And it was almost, I think it's a three judge panel. Every judge was pushing back. This is ridiculous. The loans were all paid back. The banks testified they wanted to do additional loans. How can there be any kind of fraud? And what interest, what standing is it's a, a legal term? You have to have skin in the game to bring a case. Uh, so, you know, there have been a lot of cases where they they said, well, you just don't have standing. Uh, and it's a way for the, I call it the lazy judge rule because the judges don't want to make a hard decision 
So they say, well, you, you really can't bring the case. So anyway, by the end of the case, the, and the rebuttal part of their argument, the prosecutors were not defending their actions or the case. They were begging not to be sanctioned when the case got dismissed. Right. So, but Merchan could, if the case, if the decision doesn't come down in the next three weeks, uh, Merchan could sentence Trump to prison time. That I that will that that will cause a lot of problems. <laughs> I I don't yeah. think the the people that support Trump and the uh, people in the Patriot movement, uh, who I I know a lot of them, they they're not going to sit by and lo- allow that to happen. Their guy won; he should take office. So there's that case. Uh, that's so that's way hopefully resolved by the end of this month. Uh, the congressional, the House part is not yet determined. Although I'd say there's probably ninety percent chance that the Republicans will retain control of the House, but it be it will be by a very slim margin. And the uh, Senate is going to be Republican. So there were three three states where so that have finished counting so far, and where they've declared winners. That would be Ohio, West Virginia, and Montana have flipped from Democratic to Republican. There were no flips the other way. Um, some some House seats have flipped Republican to Democrat and Democrat to Republican, but um, so right now it looks like the Republicans going to control all three branches that you know they they or their appointees are going to control all three branches of government but the concern is what what are the democrats going to do in the interim but there are still some democrats who are going to make the claim that well trump was an insurrectionist because of uh the, the last election and the 14th amendment does not allow him to do that The Supreme Court's already addressed that in a couple cases where they tried to remove Trump from the ballot. I think that those cases will probably, uh, I I don't see that as a huge option for the Democrats. Uh, If I was advising Trump, I would advise him to get his cabinet picks in and put them into two, I don't know how many people are in the cabinet. Let's say there's 12. I, I really don't know. Put them into two packages and submit the package to the uh, Republican Senate before Trump is sworn in, so that when Trump is sworn in, he can begin doing what he needs to do immediately with his cabinet secretaries in place. The Democrats did that under Biden, by the way, so it's not without president. They they submitted like a package of six or eight at one time to be considered for appointment. And of course, you know, the Republicans didn't fight it. They went ahead and approved the people in the Senate group uh, went ahead and approved it. Although the Republicans didn't really control the Senate at that point, but uh, there wasn't a big fight. And so there shouldn't be a big fight here because the ultimate result is going to be whoever Trump appoints is going to be appointed as a cabinet secretary. Mm -hmm. There are the other thing that I think he would do I think he should do is to, uh, well, there, there are a couple cases still pending against Trump. There's the Georgia state election case. And of course, it's been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that the prosecutors in that case are completely corrupt and need to be disbarred. I, I don't see that case as really going anywhere. Uh, it should be dismissed. I think if a Georgia Court of Appeals got their hands on, of course, this is in Atlanta. It's a Democratic stronghold. If it got up into an an appellate situation, they would have a a different mix of judges. Uh, So I think that one will be dismissed. And then there is the documents case against Trump that's brought by the special prosecutor, Jack Smith, who is, in my view, he's as corrupt as they come in terms that he will do anything for the Democrats. You know, I was a lawyer. You know, you have some lawyers that will say anything and do anything. 
I'd put Jack Smith in that category. Now, the word today is that Trump has said, I'm firing the special prosecutor, which is his option as the president, because the special prosecutor operates under the judicial branch or the uh, the uh, Justice Department, and he can fire. Them. And he said, I'm going to fire him two second, one or two seconds after I'm sworn in. So now today, Jack Smith is talking about trying to craft an exit to the case. I think that's for two purposes. He knows it's over. The judge in the Florida case has dismissed the case. It's on appeal right now because uh, they said that he was not properly appointed and all of this work is, is, I don't know, illegal and proper. So that, that, that case is going away. And, and I'm thinking he's also trying to find an exit because I do think there is a very concerted desire for revenge lawfare. Uh, and I honestly, if somebody came to me and asked me to dissuade the people in charge from doing that, I would be hard pressed to give one argument in support of doing not pursuing the people that did this right right and you you've investigated j6 you know far more about it than me the other thing so i i think if i was advising the president if anybody listened to me my advice would be this president trump go to the inauguration get sworn in and as you're leaving the podium make a short speech and at the end, actually at the end of your speech, say, we have some serious issues in this country that need to be uh, dealt with. I know they have a parade scheduled. Y'all go and enjoy the parade. I'm going back to the White House. I have a lot of work to do. And he should immediately go to the White House and he should start signing executive orders that undo all the garbage that Joe Biden put in. And I think that he should, I don't know if I would do it a blanket situation. Listen, Donald Trump is a lame duck. Okay. Uh, every president in their second term is a lame duck in America. Barack Obama was a lame duck. When you're a lame duck, you're one of the things that happens is you're allowed to, you can do things you, you might not normally do because you don't have to run for office again. So Trump's never running for office again, unless they change the amendment that limits presidents to two term. And there's already some talk about that, but he would be 82 years old at that point. Yeah. I, just, yeah. I don't think it would be wise, but I would, I don't know if I would do it in a blanket case, but I would start issuing pardons like crazy for J six people, Steve yeah. Bannon, yeah. um, uh, uh, Peter Navarro, who were, I think, illegally and improperly convicted of contempt and the, the uh, Democratic election lawyers like Mark Elias run around saying, Steve Bannon is a convicted felon. He's not a convicted felon. He was convicted of a misdemeanor, yet in a, and I, I have to research this, but very unusual for a person convicted of a misdemeanor to actually go to a federal prison to serve your sentence. Um, but so I, I think that that's, I think there's, I think certainly with regard to J6, and I think the way that Trump would present that to the people is look, uh, our um, national nightmare is, is over. We need to move forward. We need to unite and move forward. And I think that would carry the day for a lot of people. But that's, I'm not in charge, so it's, <laughs> but that's just, that would be my advice to him. But I, I think he needs to deal with the J6 issues. And there are I, some other issues. There, there are some other issues, people convicted of garbage things outside of J6 uh, that need to be pardoned. And he needs to put in place new rules like on environmental things and that sort of thing. 
And I think he's, and I know that whoever, I think I would be tempted if I were him to appoint a temporary short-term uh, attorney general who would come in and his, his goal would be to just clean house. And he should fire the FBI director and the FBI assistant director and the assistant to the assistant director because I think the, the organization is corrupt. Mm -hmm. And Trump needs to spend the first hours that he's in office sending messages to people. I think he should also said follow up on his uh, campaign talk where he said, we have hostages in Gaza, and if they're not released, we're coming after you mm -hmm. in a very big way, mm -hmm. and then follow through on it. And interestingly, now we have a lot of assets in the military assets in the Middle East, and we should go after Hamas, what's left of them, and uh, Iran, who sponsored it. Well, we know in the past how he's uh, he's dealt with people and had phone calls and then uh, saying, here's a picture of your house, you know. Yeah. Uh, deal yeah, with that's this. the famous so, Af the Afghan, mm. uh, whatever the group in Afghan was, the Taliban. Mm. And he had some, like, you know, here's a picture of your house. And if you don't, we're going to withdraw. I know what it was. They were having a meeting with the representative of the Taliban. Mm. And he said, I consider you a terrorist organization. We're going to withdraw. And if one American gets hurt or harmed in the process of withdrawal, here's a picture of your house and we're coming after you. Mm. And, uh, and I think he would do it. So, you know, sometimes he did like most American presidents. He did things just for show. There was that the cruise missiles, 14, 15 cruise missiles, you know, that cost probably $30 million uh, total were sent into an air base in Syria, and it just blew some holes in the runway. It didn't really do that good of a job, uh, in my opinion. So it was just a symbolic show. I don't think it would be symbolic this time. And, nice. you know, there were things released by the Ayatollah Khomeini last week about, uh, well, actually, it's always interesting. You should always follow the posters that are put up in Tehran because they tell the regime's intentions because they're often posted in Hebrew. So, you know, there was a picture of all the missiles coming in when they did the 180 ballistic missiles into Israel uh, around the 1st of October. Uh, they had a picture. They have all these missiles raining down. And in the middle of the, the picture is the Temple Mount with the Dome of the Rock. And that's a very important thing to Shia Islam. The Shia Islam seems to be more oriented towards Jerusalem than Mecca. Yes. Now that may be because they they may not have any hope of controlling Mecca because of the Saudi regime. Um, but uh, there was an interesting interview recently. Her name was Ram Ramwa Ram. Ramwa Osman. Is that the Syria? Is that the Syrian Lebanon lady? Yeah, she's just phenomenally and brave. Hmm. You know, it's like pray for her protection. When I heard what she was saying, she was raised in a home. One parent was Sunni, one parent was Shia. She was raised in Syria. She ended up in, I think, in Lebanon for a while, and then went to Israel. And she's a committed Zionist now. And she was the one who pointed out in that interview with Elon Levy, this was about a month ago, mm. on his podcast, uh, The State of a Nation, on his YouTube channel. She said that Shia and Sunni, there's a fight over Jerusalem. Saudi Arabia wants to protect Mecca because it's, if for no other reason, it's an enormous cash cow. Three million people a year come to Mecca for the Hajj, but Iran would like to make that Jerusalem as a way to kind of get into the hearts of Sunni people throughout the Middle East. Uh, Turkey also has a lot of things going on in the Jerusalem area, the way they're funding different groups throughout the old city and elsewhere about uh, trying to get 
they want to get control of the tempo valve because Erdogan wants to restore the Ottoman Empire. Uh, that's that's long been his goal. And by the way, over the last nobody hears about this. Over the last couple of weeks, uh, Turkey has conducted over a thousand bombing runs into the Kurdish areas of Syria. And I I don't know if they've gone into Iraq or not, but they're they're that's that's actual genocide. That that Erdogan is doing, but no, nobody protests that because it doesn't involve Jews. So that's the reason why it gets a fair shake. So anyway, so back to America. Look, this is a historic election. It's an amazing thing that we've seen happen. Um, I was over at Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills last night listening to Jack Hibbs, who's very dialed into Trump. And he was saying, I went, you know, I, I was depressed all day Tuesday because I thought that we were going to lose. Mm. And now I'm having trouble processing. You know, here we are the next day. He's talking about it to his congregation, you know, sort of having trouble processing the fact that this actually happened. So I did an update at Calvary Chapel of the Harbor with Tom Hughes and Pastor Joe Pettick on Tuesday on election evening, and we were breaking in with updates. Uh, it was pretty clear the trend, but it, you know the mainstream media was sort of slow walking it. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I, by the way, I saw a. Um, I, I'll have to double check this, but I think it's accurate based on my knowledge. Uh, it was the vote totals for president over the last five or six elections for Democrats. And they were all around 65 million to 70 some million total votes for their candidate, except 2020. And Joe Biden got 91 million. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> but I'm sure there's nothing there. So, so that's leading to a lot of conspiracy theories now that, well, Trump is really part of the deep state and a globalist and all this stuff secretly. And he's the Antichrist and he's deceiving everybody. Uh, so, you know, look, I guess my reaction would be pay attention to what he does. Hold him accountable. Make him toe the line. And, I mean, it's, uh, in, it, it's interesting you said that and then you've opened with the fact that you know, a lot of every single president over a period of time, they all, um, they all, uh, you know, well, they all think that every president is is the is the antichrist. But I suppose the other thing with with uh, with President Elect Trump is the whole thing of Project Warp Speed, and understandably, people have been have raised questions over that, and they have even raised questions over that. Um, now and then you've had the Christian various Christians online going, I can't vote for any of them. Um, you're right, this is going to unfold, isn't it? Well, I, I'm pretty sure, Mark, that Jesus is not running any election in the history of the church anyway, so it's always sort of a question of the lesser of two evils. Mm. Part of me almost hoped that Kamala Harris would win because I'm old. That, impact that she would have on me might not be, you know, I might not be around long enough to feel it, but um, I, I almost hope that she would win just to quiet down the people who claim that Trump is the Antichrist. And I have a lot of friends, they claim that Obama is the Antichrist. And so now I don't know what they're, what they're saying today. I haven't received any messages from any of them yet. <laughs> I think well, maybe, uh, maybe they're looking at, Maybe they're looking at uh, King Charles the Third, and then maybe Prince William. Who knows? Uh, he's. Um, I saw a good, and there's. I love the one thing that you can say about technology is it allows people to be creative. So they had a, a a video that they put up. It was the unveiling of that ridiculous, horrible portrait of Prince Charles, mm -hmm. and as they unveiled it, it was not. Prince Charles, it was a video of Donald Trump, you know, doing something to uh, 
the the village people's song um you know that disco song that they mm. did mm. so and then you you know there's compilations of the reactions of people crying swearing i don't know what i'm going to do i can't go on living uh, there's also people that are, you know, hey, you know, we'll charter flights for you if you want to leave, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you said you were going to leave, so why are you still here? You know. Yep. Yep. So I, I don't, I don't see this being overturned. And, and you know, and then people say, well, why were they able to cheat in 2020, but they didn't cheat this year? And I don't know the answer to that. You know, obviously, one's interpretation of that would be well you know trump's okay with them he's part of us anyway so he's going to do a lot of what we want to do anyway so we'll let him win this time there's uh, a couple of there, there's a, a comment on that i'll make sure we've got to re we've got to remember the covid laws of 2020 we've got to remember all of that the the absolute psycholo psychological attack on all of us but, right. but in regard to the election the ballot harvesting the ballot stuffing the suddenly oh we're going to stop this vote count at eight o'clock we're going to blacken windows i've forgotten where that was whether that was in michigan um we're going to blacken the window i think it was in detroit they put up yeah. i think they actually put up white uh you know panels to yeah. block the view so we're going to do that we've got all these mail-in ballots with etc cetera, etc cetera. and then suddenly biden gets all these votes far more than uh, obama deeply questionable when an individual was in a basement and never went out and did rallies so all of that we have to throw into the mix and i think i agree with you i'm a bit like you like with what jack hibbs is saying and other friends having had those conversations with we're now you know we're dated it's the 7th of november so i've had some conversations and i think people are trying to take in what's happened so john where where does this take us in regard to um israel i'd seen a big there was a big picture on a on a digital board i'm not sure whether it was uh may, may have been tel aviv it must have been tel aviv you know um you know trump has won etc or the, these kind of comments and supportive of that where well, is yeah, it there, where, there was there was an iranian poster in tehran i forgot to mention that the other day right that was a nuclear explosion yeah. and the caption in hebrew was tell oshima it was the Iranians saying we're going to nuke Tel Aviv. Hmm. That's that's a poster in Tehran. I mean, it's the full. It's like a eight or ten story building. The whole side of the building is a poster. Wow. I mean, so, that, that that went up on Tuesday, right? And of course, you you and I in our last time we spoke, you you quite rightly, and and also with your legal expertise and your legal eye. And then, and you've just gone through what's happening in New York with the AG and with this case and all the rest. But we've now got 73 days, I think, until 73, 74 days, I haven't worked out the math, until January the 20th. And we're concerned about what could go on from there. You started saying that in regard to what was happening in New York. But where does this base in regard to how, how could, what do you think is going through the lunatics you know, in Iran, do they are they actually saying, well, we've got a window now that we have to act? Um, do we see China then turning around and going, we now have got to invade Taiwan? And don't get me wrong, these are things I don't necessarily want to see, but it's again war gaming, trying to put us trying to see what would happen. And also, you in our last last uh, conversation, you laid out brilliantly about this whole thing of in the past they were called obama you know um ha leftovers people that were inside like the deep state which is real what would the biden administration the kamala administration do you think be doing in which to embedded people you talked about that lady that uh iranian links um the information that they then sent to the enemy in regard to what Israel might be doing, et cetera, et cetera. Well, my, responding. My concern yeah. is someone like her, and I can name against last name begins with an A, and she's very pro-Iranian. I mean, she's mm. 
she's worked with the Iranian NGOs asking, yep. hey, you know, when I testify at Congress, how should I present this? Yeah. So it's poor Iran. By the way, I just pulled up the vote totals. So I'll give you the vote totals for Democrat for president. I was a little bit inaccurate in what I said. So 2004, that would have been Bush against uh, cool. Colonel J uh, Lurch, John Kerry. John Kerry, sorry, sorry, go. Kerry, Kerry got fifty nine yep. million. Two thousand eight, Obama got sixty nine million. Twenty twelve, Obama got sixty five million. Twenty sixteen, Hillary Clinton got sixty five million. In twenty twenty four, Kamala Harris got sixty six million. In twenty twenty, Joe Biden got eighty one million. I rest my case. <laughs> I, I rest I'm my sure case. it was just a lot of people really, they didn't have anything else to do because of the lockdowns and everything. So they all voted. <laughs> and plus they were, they were in their basements uh, doing their mail-in ballots too. Yeah. Yeah. So if you just look for democratic presidential vote totals over the years, a, a Twitter search or X search, it'll pop up immediately. There's they're, they're all over the place. Well, per personally, without getting into too conspiratorial um it raises it raises that question and uh, and you wonderfully said that the first thing that trump needs to do as soon as he you know is uh, inaugurated is to start dishing out pardons like uh, ice creams um that is what should happen in regard to the j6 and thank you for saying that because no i i, I think i i are, honestly i would recommend that the, the president bring in some of you guys who've done a lot of research on that whole issue and have a big sit down meeting. And I'd have the attorney general there and the uh, DOJ, the new DOJ prosecution team to decide whether people should be prosecuted for the propagation of lies that were done. Because there were, you know, with that committee, there were incredibly unethical things done by people like Liz Cheney. The whole committee was improperly, illegally constituted. It, it was, they've never had uh, Adam, Adam, what's his name? Uh, and all the rest, yeah. Adam Adam Schiff, who's now a Adam. senator from, uh, from California. Uh, and so I would, I would tell somebody like Liz Cheney, Nancy Pelosi, because of the things she did, Adam Schiff, Jamie Raskin, hey guys, lawyer up. Yeah, probably a good yeah, time well, to go get your again. Well, get, ja get well Jamie, I, I think it's Jamie Raskin who is already raising a, a specter of some activity on January the 6th. Yeah, year, I, I don't know that that's, yeah, I think they sort of threw him out there because, well, he's in California. He's a lunatic. He's always going to win election out there anyway. And the communist enclave that he represents. But mm. I do think, so, you know, I'm a litigator. And, uh, one of the big issues over the years that became an increasing issue was called spoliation of evidence. Um, and particularly in the electronic area. And I did a lot of research. I did seminars on it. So I, I, I know what I'm talking about. And there, I apologize if there's noise outside that, that you can hear. I'm staying with a friend in Temecula, and I guess today is the lawn care day, so they're out. Uh... No, no, not at all. Okay, no, no, no. <laughs> it's a beautiful day, in California. It's now it's it's going to be about eighty degrees, a little breezy. There's a lot of uh, high winds and some fires up around Ventura, right? Uh, County Camarillo and Moore Park, Simi Valley. Some houses have been destroyed. A lot of power outages. There were tree limb, big tree limbs down in Chino Hills last night when I was up there. Big, you know, the San Ana winds are blowing. But anyway, so back to this. I So the spoliation of evidence is a big deal in the electronic era. You know, it, when I used to start practicing law, I would do, I'd work on a case for two or three years. And I would have a little, like, that thick correspondence file of all the letters that I sent to people. But... I, you know, not too long before I uh, uh, semi-retired from the practice of law, I had a case, and in the case, the judge orders to produce all of the communications between uh, from the bank. You know, we were 
uh, had been and made a loan to a customer, pretty big loan, and they were challenging it. And so that, that included all of our emails. Well, Mark, I had in four months, I had 2,000 emails. Wow. Wow. Between me and my client, let alone all the stuff that they had internally. Yeah. So what a lot of people do is they put in a record retention policy that's very short. We're only going to maintain this electric stuff, electronic stuff for a short period of time. Got you. But then they also will try to scrub away the emails when they know that they're going to be in litigation. So to prevent that from happening here and to raise, uh, it's a thing we call a rebuttable presumption. Trump should immediately today issue a statement that all electronic and records of documentation of everybody throughout the whole scope of the federal government should be maintained for the entire period of time of the Biden administration. Now, the reason why you would do that is if they then go to and look, they've done this in regard to the uh, I think it was in regard to the J6 investigation or some of the prosecutors that were challenged. What they did was they scrubbed their phones. Like, well, I don't know if I want to use names because they would sue me for libel if I was wrong. But names that you would recognize, names yes. that I've run into in my law practice. Mm -hmm. And every bad thing that you think about them, I think, would be justified. But they scrubbed their phones, and how they did it was they just entered, if you like enter the wrong password like 36 times into an iPhone or something, it will scrub the phone. And so they did that. Oh, you know, I forgot my password. Oh, you mean the one that you use 80 times a day for the last 18 years? And you've had the same one, you know, on all your phones. Now this one you can't remember. It's total. It's it's total. Uh, that that that's why uh, the whole Hillary Clinton emails servers in a, you know, her airing cupboard in this apartment and another one at uh, one at uh, Upper State New York. Uh, the yeah, up in Connecticut, or I guess it was yeah. in New York. In New York, where they live, yeah, yeah. So Westchester um, County, yeah. So. But what that happens, would... yeah, let me just explain what happens. So mm. let's say Trump issues that mm. and then they get into litigation, court cases and stuff. And the people say, well, I, I accidentally deleted all of my emails. That's when this rebuttable presumption would come in from uh, the spoliation cases that would say, well, the presumption is that if you did that, you deleted everything because those emails and whatever would support the claims that are being made against you. Now you can rebut that, but it's almost impossible to do that, to beat a rebuttable presumption like that. And that's the only way that they've, the courts have found that they've been able to prevent people from destroying evidence. I mean, it used to be people would, um, you know, they would, they would, the document would actually, you know, the dog would eat it or it fell into the fire, the bonfire outside, out back of my house when we were roasting marshmallows <laughs> or something, you know, so, and, but the most electronic records right now, they're, it's really, it's almost impossible to delete them anyway. They can be recovered with the right tools and the right budget. Uh, you can get things, but so I would, if I was Trump, I would issue that order statement today that, uh, we will be investigating the things that were done to people that think that we think were done improperly. And you are hereby notified that all electronic records from every aspect of the Biden administration are to be maintained and not deleted in any fashion. We will, if, if they need to be deleted later. We'll be in charge. It will take care of it. So it's a bit like it's a bit like if the 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 conversation's gone on that uh, through the election, that when they came across 
um, you know, voting, etc., or various setups that look very dodgy. They immediately, the, on the Republic, on, on the campaign side, they immediately had their lawyers in place in which to deal to deal with that and take whoever to court. So that's this, what they did that in this cycle before the election, as yes. opposed to doing it after the election last time. That's a huge difference. Yes. Because once the election's taken place, the courts are very reluctant in a country that follows democratic uh, principles on voting to undo those votes because it, it creates a huge logistical mess. Uh, what, are, what are you going to do if you invalidate all the votes in Atlanta? Or all which the is, votes which in is what, absolutely, which is why uh, Jan 6 happened because right. the people went there i mean let's just say this i do apologize I try not to give an american a a, a, less, a lesson about their electoral college or why people turned up you know what the importance of jan six but it's important to go over this because they were then that's why they went there because it's turning around and saying excuse me there are some very very severe questions in regard to the voting in regard to the counting right. in these states so that's why people were asked um very very you know to go and peacefully protest and peacefully exercise their constitutional rights and I find it absolutely fascinating when the Democrats keep going on about our democracy, our democracy, and then suddenly Kamala in her in her thankful, in her sort of speech to uh, the people that have help, helped her or not, um, you know, saying our suddenly using the word constitution, which I find very, very interesting. So, so but right, they, they got all the way, that. Mark, did Sorry. You, did, did you see the mashup that somebody did? of the Kamala concession speech and Hillary's concession speech speech. No. They're they're almost identical. Exactly. Absolutely. So uh, but, Kamala plagiarized again. Yeah, but absolutely. So so the Republicans, does it mean that the Republicans had actually learned, learned quite a lot from 2020, um, in regard and putting your legal head on, that they'd actually got ahead of the headwind on that. Yeah, they, they attacked it on many levels. They had many, many lawyers. Mm. Uh, and they and I think the realization was, look, we can't successfully challenge things after the election because the courts will say stuff like, well, you don't have standing. That's right. You know, that's right. So, OK, now what do we do? So they put in, you know, precinct watchers to watch at the local level mm. to make things mm. work. Doing that. And of course, then the Democrats are going, oh, look, they're trying to steal, intimidate people from not voting. No, we're just trying to make sure that, you know, everything runs properly. They had a, a number of cases. <clears throat> they had a team of about 500 lawyers that could file these cases immediately. They also ran people for Secretary of State and other uh, uh, offices that control voting. Uh, they they worked on getting people onto election boards and key places that they suspected there might be problems. So when and I, I saw someone posting about this yesterday, and I, I just don't think they've thought through it. They said, well, you know, all the challenges were unsuccessful. And why didn't they cheat this time? Well, that's I don't I don't think you understand that one, they were prevented from cheating in a lot of cases. And so the point this person was trying to make, well, see, Donald Trump must be in the, they, they allowed the election to be stolen. And now they let Trump in. They didn't challenge anything. They didn't try to cheat because they wanted Trump in there because he's, you know, a globalist, antichrist, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I, I just think it's a very, uh, I'm sure this person may be unfriending me if he ever sees this. I thought it was a very shallow analysis it, because um, I, 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 this sounds arrogant when I say it, but I'm a lawyer and understand the system a little yeah. bit better than you do. Yeah. So you don't have to believe me. You know, you, you don't have to think that I know everything. That's fine. Uh, you know, my life is going to go on tomorrow, whether you think that or not. But listen, 
uh, things were done differently this time. And the, you know, Trump won the popular vote. So he he got a clear mandate. Mandate. And now with the Republicans appearing to control both House and the Senate, certainly the Senate and probably the House, um, it, there's a new sheriff in town. Now, you asked a very good question though earlier that we didn't really address. Uh, the... Uh, what what are pe- what are various nefarious actors in the world going to do? Um, that's a very interesting question. There's just a number. Of course, China is always threatening Taiwan. I think Taiwan really needs to cement it. I first of all, I don't think the United States the United States can quickly be spread too thin around yes. the world. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, China has a lot of, and people always point, well, China's got a lot more ships than we do, but it's a whole different, it's a whole different class of ships. Our ships are large, uh, in many cases, nuclear, we have these miniaturized nuclear reactors on these ships that power the ships. They, they can be at sea for a very long time. They don't have to go to port except to get food and stuff for the crew. Chinese ships are diesel. They have, and, and China doesn't have gas and oil reserves. So if they, so let's say somebody takes off, takes out Karj Island, oil uh, port in Iran, mm. that will soon percolate into massive problems for, uh, for China because they get, they're the biggest customer of Iranian oil and they, they have, they get a, a discount price for it. In Iran, it doesn't matter. The oil's there. They just have to pump it out and put it on a ship, and they need the money to fund their terror operations. So there's two ways to shut that down. You can do it through sanctions, and Iran's always trying to get around the sanctions with ghost ships and that type of thing. Or you just bomb their facility where 90% of their oil transits. Uh, that, That would... So that that's a positive, but China China is limited to a range of a uh, a thousand miles. They, they they can't project power over the vast distances of the oceans like the Americans can. No nobody can do what the Americans can do. And I know people will say, "Well, Russia." And I'm like, you know, we have uh, what do we have? Eleven, twelve aircraft carriers, in the United States. Russia has one. It's an old one. It's diesel powered. And when it goes out, it it has a contingent of tugboats that go with it because it's always breaking down. Um, And Russia's economy is only about the size of the state of Texas anyway. So, um, but Russia may see this as an opportunity. And I'm I'm speaking at a conference tomorrow here, hopeforourtimes.com. And uh, I think the title of my talk, I'm still, we'll be finishing it up tonight, is at the appointed time. Because a lot of these things in Bible prophecy, they've been around for a long time. People have been speculating about this or that for a very long time. But are we at that time? So one area I'll be talking about is demographics. The demographics of the West and major players in these end times Bible prophecy, for the most part, are collapsing. Uh, in the Tehran Times, a number of times over the last four years, they have published this blurb. Uh, Iran has had the fastest collapse in female fertility of any country in human history. Now process wow. that. So what are the Ayatollahs going to do? You know, the Ayatollahs used to joke around, well, if we're 70 million, if you kill 35 million of us, we still have 35 million left. But if you run the demographics numbers, we don't have to kill 35 million you know, because you're just going to disappear. Japan will lose 2 million people in population this year. China is losing millions of people each year. They've sex selected, they have massive excess populations of males over females. Uh, that 
and, and these demographic collines, Russia's having it, and they're all trying to turn it around. And I will tell you right now, I think it's part of the end time scenarios and it's irreversible in every single case. It, it will not recover. You know, so and, and and that then is the whole immigration issue within Europe as well, as we're seeing our uh, birth rates fall and our demographics change. Right, and you regard. and you need people to fill in those spaces. Hmm. And so now I I heard that uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, I would say Sajid Khan or whatever the guy's name is, the mayor of London is. Yeah, 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 yeah. It yeah. probably would be a good idea to learn uh, to speak Arabic. Well, the Batayor wrote a book, uh, Eurasia and Demitude, and went a number of years ago, I think 2003-4, and uh, laid out, she talked about that in regard to uh, migration of Europe, et cetera, et cetera. And we have, I'm trying to find a correspondent I had with a uh, member of parliament because I need to publish that. A few I, years. I, saw, I saw a wonderful speech this morning on my X feed of a... Mm. Um, a member, I think it was the House of Lords that was speaking about what's going on there. I don't know if you, I'll, I'll try to send it to you. Baroness Foster stands up at the House of Lords and addresses the threat of terrorism on the streets of the UK, the anti Semitism, and the hate marches. Okay. Well, she said, You see these hate marches, and if you respond to them, you're the one who, if you, protest that then you're the ones who go to prison and these well i think ab absolutely and i think uh, i think immediately and i'm just saying john we've got the last sort of four or five minutes i right. think immediately after the after the uh, trump uh, win that there may be a, you know an anti racism march being uh, organized in london as we speak for this uh, coming saturday here we go again i feel as i'm living I'm reliving 2016 and then all, you know, let's get the blimp up, let's get this, let's get that. What I was referring to earlier, sorry, was trying to find correspondence I have with a member of parliament when we signed under Theresa May, along with a load of other stuff, is the Global Migration Compact. Right. And then, she, and then she was going out the door. She signed all the net zero stuff where well, she was extremely woke not a conservative and that's been taken a while to convince people of that but john in the last few minutes um and i i'm fully aware of your incredible graphic that you're going to use that you showed last time but where um what's going to be the turn of support without it being too much of a leading question for for israel from uh, from president trump what what is going to happen I, I think Trump's whole, uh, the the base of Trump's support, the avid ad, active base, wants America to stop fighting wars overseas. Mm, mm. So I think you'll, you'll hear Trump, I don't know if he'll come out publicly and say it, I'm sure he will be calling Prime Minister Netanyahu and saying, Bibi, I don't care what you do, get this over with. The problem is the ammunition stores Absolutely. are dwindling. Yeah. Carolyn Glick reported that some soldiers were killed in southern Lebanon just because they don't have adequate bullets. They have to be very mm. careful in using their it's awful. ammunition. It's awful. Yeah. They have <laughs> interceptor rockets and everything. It, it's kind of a bad spiral that they're in. And I don't think you'll see any support from the uh Biden administration. We will see uh, Obama type tactics used like they did with resolution 2334. I think you'll see some things done at the UN. US will not only not veto things, they will introduce legislation that are, you know, resolutions that will sort of try to set the and control the agenda. They won't be any unfunding of UNRWA. They, they will double down on this. Uh, and they, they'll slow walk the weapons to Israel at a pretty critical time. So it may be that the mullahs in Iran just thought, said, you know, we'll see how the election goes and then we'll decide. Um, and what they might do is they might wait. So let's say the Biden administration slow walks weapons stores to Israel. 
the MOLAs might just sit back and wait till January 20th, then attack on January 20th as a way that they would think to send a message to Donald Trump. See what we can do. And Israel won't be able to respond adequately. There was an Iranian guy the other day talking about how their missiles can divide into 100 missiles. Now, I don't know if that's true. That could be pure propaganda. But if that's true, that's a game changer. I mean, that's almost impossible to defend against. We have the drone things. And by the way, I, I need to bring this up. Russia is very much involved in this. Yes. They have interests contrary to us. I don't care what people, I, we, we still, we got to get that interview with Trevor Loudon set up. Yes. But, yeah. Yeah. But Russia, the Washington Post published an article a couple of weeks ago that there's a secret city outside of Moscow where Russia has done its bioweapons program. It has been massively expanded. That was reported two weeks ago. Last week, or earlier this week, the Russians released a manual for their field people fighting wherever about how to do mass burials. Right. Now, yeah. that this, this brings to mind things like the bearer of Daniel and prophecy mm -hmm. and the horse of pestilence and revelation. I'm telling you, we, we are at, and so that's why I'm titling my talk, at the appointed time. I really do think we are approaching that time. These things will happen at the appointed time. And they've been bouncing around for years and decades. And now I, they're going to be coming hear. to fruition. I hear. John, I'm sorry to sort of stop I now. And I think and uh, I think that's a good point to stop. I wish you were uh, I wish you a wonderful presentation and enjoy and uh, and in regard to the uh, conference that you're attending and I will get this up and, um, you know, hope God willing, we'll, uh, we'll have a conversation uh, again very quickly and catch up because as things will be moving very fast, but John, thank you so much for your time. Stay there. I'll say goodbye to you on the other side and thank okay. you everyone for, uh, for listening. And I think the number one thing is, is that there is much to pray about and not no room for complacency but there is much to pray about so thank you for joining me and i'll just play us out <laughs>